Hey, Nassau Presbyterian Church. Happy Easter. It's great to be with you again. I haven't seen you since Advent, so I hope you had a Merry Christmas, uh, Happy New Year, an excellent Epiphany, a fantastic Fat Tuesday, an aspirational Ash Wednesday, and a groveling penitential Lent. Sinful, wicked, totally depraved bunch of... Sorry. Sorry. I took up being judgmental for Lent, and it's been intoxicating. I gave up bathing. But now it's Easter, and he is risen. Woo! He is risen indeed! As we continue to recover from a global pandemic that has radically altered the lives of so many people and look back on the incredible loss of life worldwide, thinking about the resurrection this year takes on some added significance. So I wanted to look at a few works of art that convey both the physical transformation as well as some of the more intangible aspects of Christ's resurrection. A first work of art comes to us from 16th century Germany in the hands of Matthias Grunewald. The Eisenheim altarpiece was produced in response to a different epidemic. It's a huge polyptic. Sounds like something you need to get removed. A work comprised of four or more different panels. It has 10 paintings arranged on two sets of doors that in turn conceal a complex array of wooden sculptures done by some other guy. Hold on. Two of them work on the project, but only Grunwald gets the attention? That's terrible. People should know both names, like George Michael and the other guy from Wham, or Elton John and his other guy. Most of the time, the doors would be closed, displaying a central crucifixion scene, flanked by depictions of St. Sebastian and St. Anthony, as well as a lamentation scene below on the base or predella of the altarpiece. On certain feast days, the doors that make up the crucifixion scene would be opened, revealing four different paintings, including an Annunciation, Choirs of Angels, a Madonna and Child, and the Resurrection. The middle two paintings are on yet another set of doors that can open, revealing the final two paintings on the opposite sides of the doors, St. Anthony Tempted in the Wilderness and St. Anthony with St. Paul the Hermit, as well as the wooden sculptures of the other guy. Art Garfunkel. No, wait, he was the other guy in Simon and Garfunkel. The town of Eisenheim is in modern-day France, not far from the borders of Germany and Switzerland. Back in the 16th century, it was part of the Holy Roman Empire, and it was home to a monastery that was run by the Brothers of St. Anthony, who specialized in caring for victims of their own epidemic, a skin disease called ergotism. Ergotism was caused by a fungus that grows on ryegrass, which would then contaminate the flour and bread made from the rye and infect the person who ate it. Poisoned individuals would slowly deteriorate over time, both physically and mentally, suffering symptoms ranging from convulsive seizures, sores, and gangrene to hallucinations and psychosis. In the medieval period, the disease was called St. Anthony's Fire, and the Antonite monks at Eisenheim cared for their victims by giving them good bread, a topical paste made from herbs, and a special wine marinated in those same herbs, as well as the relics of St. Anthony. They also commissioned many works of art for their church, the most famous of which is our altarpiece. Rather than presenting the people suffering from St. Anthony's fire with an image of health and beauty and serenity like one might see in a hospital today, Grunewald painted a mix of hallucinatory beauty and stomach-churning suffering. This crucifixion scene is unlike any other that I know of. The content is typical for the most part. Christ on the cross, Mary Magdalene weeping at the foot of the cross, a fainting Virgin Mary held by the Apostle John. Somewhat less common are a symbolic lamb with a cross pouring out its blood into the Holy Grail, and John the Baptist holding the scriptures and pointing at the crucified Christ as if to say, this is all your fault, you sinful bunch of sinners. But Grunewald deviated sharply from common practice in the way that he painted Christ's body. Rather than depicting the crucifixion in a symbolic manner, as many artists have done, where Christ practically floats in front of the cross with an idealized body and highly stylized wounds, Grunewald painted Jesus hanging down, arms stretching uncomfortably, fingers splayed out convulsively, and an emaciated, gangrenous body with yellowish-greenish skin riddled with sores. In other words, he painted Christ with St. Anthony's fire. This is also clear in the lamentation scene in the predella at the bottom. The patients at the hospital 
would see a vision of Christ suffering from their own condition. But Grunewald went even further to connect this image of Christ's suffering with that of the infected. As is still the case today, amputation was often a necessary treatment for gangrene, and many of the patients at Eisenheim would have been facing the prospect of losing a limb if they hadn't already. Normally in a crucifixion scene, the cross is right in the center for a symmetrical, balanced composition. But as you can see, the cross here is slightly off-center, and the reason is symbolic. As the first set of doors are opened, the crucified Christ will lose his arm, and as the predella doors are removed, the Christ in the lamentation will lose his legs. Patients, we come to this church and see an image of Christ suffering not only the traditional pains of the cross, but the specific pains of their own medical condition. His bodily suffering was their bodily suffering, offering them the hope that he was truly with them. But on feast days, the patients who had been assured through the gruesome front panels that Jesus felt and understood their own suffering would have an opportunity to see visions of transcendent beauty and serenity in the Annunciation, Choirs of Angels, and Madonna and Child paintings. But more importantly, a glimpse of transformational bodily restoration in the resurrection. Why, <coughs> Jesus? This image is a quite practically hallucinatory vision, Jesus, of the risen Christ. Why, <sighs> Jesus? His skin and hair obviously contrast directly with his appearance on the front panels. The dark hair and beard have been replaced with a glowing blonde mane, and the pockmarked greenish yellowish skin is now smooth in a shockingly pale white. Yikes, it makes Warner Solomon's Jesus look practically Middle Eastern. Christ's wounds from the cross, the nail holes in his hands and feet, and the cut in his side remain only as symbolic elements, mere dabs of red, identifying this as the risen Christ, but no longer the source of any physical pain. Putting ourselves in the position of a 16th century German whose body has been marred by gangrene and amputation, this resurrected Jesus must have been a comforting image of bodily healing and restoration. In addition to this corporeal transformation, Grunewald depicted this moment as a supernatural act. Christ hovers in mid-air, floating above the open sarcophagus and soldiers who have all passed out in terror, wrapped in an iridescent cloak that billows around him. Behind him, a glowing orb radiates power and vibrant colors, like an oversized halo. This is similar to the mandorla, a full-body halo that envelops Christ in many last judgment scenes. It's an expression of otherworldly power, dominating the physical realities of our world, from gravity to infectious diseases to death itself. The altarpiece is no longer in a church in Eisenheim, but in a museum in Colmar, a few kilometers north. I have no idea how far that is. What is that, like 100 feet? The doors have been removed and displayed so that all the paintings can be seen at all times. But now that they're visible not just to visitors to the museum, but to hundreds of millions of people around the world through the magic of the internet machine, what is the impact of an image of Jesus who gets whiter and blonder as an expression of bodily resurrection? Knowing the context of its creation and the original intended audience, I still believe this to be an incredible and powerful piece, especially the crucifixion scene. However, it does highlight the inherent limitations of bodily representations of Christ. In desiring a Christ that identifies with their own suffering or the suffering of those around them, European artists have, more often than not, created a Christ with whom they identify, one who looks like they do. And clinging to a familiar physical representation can put Christ in a box, especially when trying to express the radical transformational power of the resurrection. There's a scene that takes place almost immediately after the resurrection called Noli Me Tangere, or Touch Me Not, which is the subject of numerous paintings and relief sculptures. It depicts the moment where Mary Magdalene, distraught after having found the tomb empty and initially mistaking Jesus for the gardener, finally recognizes him and reaches out to him. But Christ does not allow her to embrace him. It's a strange moment. Why would Jesus deny Mary a hug after being dead for three days? Jesus certainly had no problem with Thomas touching him later on, as we can see in Caravaggio's cringy reproduction. Ugh. But that was a response to Thomas's disbelief, which is obviously not Mary's problem. There's a similar slightly awkward moment earlier in the Lenten season, 
that may shed some light on Christ's seemingly cold rejection. The Transfiguration is another much reproduced scene in art history. Raphael's painting from 1520 is a classic, but my personal favorite is the Byzantine-era mosaic found in St. Catherine's Monastery in Mount Sinai, Egypt. The brilliant gold background helps to underscore the shocking supernatural qualities of this event, in which Jesus, having ascended a mountain to pray with Peter, James, and John, is suddenly transfigured, his clothes shining. Moses and Elijah appear out of nowhere and talk with Jesus. The mosaic conveys the terror of the three disciples reacting to this miraculous moment. They are clearly overwhelmed, cowering on the ground as they witness their teacher radiating light and conversing with two of the greatest figures in Jewish history. What it doesn't show is the bizarre suggestion that comes from Peter in response to all of this. Obviously out of his depth, he says to Jesus that this whole thing is so great that they should build three dwellings, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Classic Peter, always pushing real estate. There's no response from Jesus to this suggestion. A cloud comes and surrounds them, a voice from heaven speaks, and the whole thing is over as quickly as it started. But it's pretty clear that this is one of the dumber things Peter says in the Gospels. Whoa, Moses, Elijah, you know what I'm thinking, Jesus? 30-year fixed-rate mortgages with a low down payment. Property values are going to skyrocket in this area, and the school district is... His impulse in the face of a glorious supernatural event seems to have been to try to lock it down and make it last forever here on Earth. Clearly, he misread the situation. And I wonder if there isn't something similar going on between Jesus and Mary in the Noli Me Tangri scene. Artists have been challenged with depicting this moment in a way that is faithful to the text, but doesn't make Jesus look rude. In Fra Angelico's painting from 1442, Mary reaches out to him, but Jesus avoids her touch. His feet are crossed as he steps away from Mary, holding out his hand to prevent her from touching him. He holds a garden hoe in his other hand, ostensibly the reason why Mary mistook him for the gardener in the first place, something seen in many other versions of this scene. In his 1520 painting, the Venetian artist Titian gives Christ a slightly more contorted pose. Leaning on the garden hoe, his hips pull away as he reaches across his body with his right hand to pull his white garment from Mary's grasp. Yet his head is inclined towards Mary as if to say, I don't want you to touch me, but I still love you. A somewhat less successful attempt can be seen in Hans Holbein the Younger's 1528 painting. As Peter and John, not having seen Jesus yet, race back to the other disciples to tell them the news of the empty tomb, an incredulous Mary reaches out toward Jesus as if she can't quite believe it's true yet. Jesus steps back with both hands raised in order to prevent Mary's touch. Looks like he's about to put a crop and God move on her. But none of these paintings seem to explain why Jesus doesn't want Mary to touch him. The answer to this question is more clearly expressed in Correggio's 1525 version of the scene. He painted Jesus standing and Mary kneeling like we've seen in Titian's and Fra Angelico's works. But Correggio linked them by using their hand gestures, creating a diagonal from the bottom left to the top right. And it's these gestures that indicate the real reason why Christ tells Mary not to touch him. Jesus' right hand is doing the normal halting gesture toward Mary, but his left hand is raised up toward the sky. This is a reference to his explanation to Mary in the text, that he has not ascended to the Father yet. But it's really Mary's hand gesture that captures the impetus for Christ's statement not to touch him. She looks up at Jesus with love and adoration, but she's not actually reaching out toward him. Instead, with her right hand, she gestures toward the ground, which completes the diagonal from Christ's raised hand, but more importantly, suggests that rather than simply being excited to see Jesus alive and wanting to embrace him, what she's really hoping for is to keep Jesus here on earth and be together again and have everything back the way it was before he got arrested and crucified. While the title for these works is Noli Me Tangere, or Touch Me Not, the actual translation from the text is closer to Don't Hold On To Me, which shifts this interaction from a odd and awkward, yes, I'm back from the dead, but don't touch me, where Jesus is simply avoiding physical contact, to Christ correcting a misunderstanding on Mary's part, letting her know that he hasn't been raised from the dead just to go back to the way it used to be and finish living out his earthly life. He's in this liminal space beyond the constraints of this world, 
but not yet ascended to heaven. So Mary's attempt to hold on to his earthly body is understandable, but ultimately impossible. Kind of like Peter's random impulse to have Jesus, Moses, and Elijah start a homeowner's association on a mountain. The resurrection wasn't accomplished to extend Christ's earthly life. It was accomplished to conquer sin and death. Something infinitely more amazing and complex than could ever be expressed through an interpretation of Christ's physical human form. For our visual representation of this complexity, though, we will have to leave behind the world of representational painting. Wait, what? And look for a more expressive form of art. No. No. That uses a more universal language. Don't do it. Of color and form. Don't say it. Abstract art. Yes, abstract art. The resurrection is beyond the constraints and explanations of our world. It's a metaphysical mystery, and abstraction can both point to and be a manifestation of this fundamental change in our existence. Traditional European painting methods, while excellent for reproducing the physical world as we see it, can often fall short when trying to express a concept, feeling, or any of the less tangible aspects of our world. This is where abstraction can free us from the boundaries and rules of our world and convey concepts and feelings that are beyond words. Like when you're playing charades and you pick an impossible phrase? No, not really. Always get the hard ones. We don't have time. Okay, six words. A bird. Two birds. Swimming. Drowning. Flower petals. Oh, it's upside down. Oh, the difference between being and becoming. Nailed it. Wow, this thing really works. European artists caught on to abstraction in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. But artists in Africa have been using abstraction for centuries to communicate ideas like spiritual power, material wealth, ideal feminine qualities, and even individual personalities. The Baule peoples in Cote d'Ivoire used the Umblo mask as a portrait of a specific person they wished to honor. But the features of the mask don't correspond with their actual physical appearance. Rather, they convey different qualities about the person, like wisdom, age, and health. There's masks like these that helped push artists like Pablo Picasso towards abstraction. It gave him the freedom to break away from the strict set of rules that had been guiding European artists for centuries as well as the gatekeepers that had made and maintained those rules. Picasso's reference to African masks in his 1907 Les Demoiselles d'Avignon set the stage for the development of Cubism, a movement in which Picasso, along with Georges Braque, aka the other guy of Cubism, broke down the physical world into increasingly complex and often confusing arrangements and created a new visual language that inspired countless other artists. While Picasso and Braque's paintings, however confusing, remained grounded in the forms of physical objects, painters like Pete Mondrian eventually moved on from the physical world and transformed his traditional landscapes into fully abstract canvases. Mondrian was looking back on the cataclysmic destruction of the First World War, which European countries had plunged headfirst into, following the usual nationalistic, imperialistic, and militaristic tendencies that had guided and divided them for centuries. In an attempt to find a universal visual language, free from the imagery and symbolism that excluded those from other countries, religions, or cultures, he and other guy, Theo van Doesburg, created fully abstract geometric compositions based on what they identified as the fundamental elements of painting that everyone could understand primary colors, values from white to black, and vertical and horizontal lines. Abstraction became both the tool and the manifestation of a peaceful utopian society. He wanted to save the world with squares. I can't believe that didn't work. Subsequent artists took abstraction in a very different direction, leaving the neat and organized and rectilinear compositions behind in favor of controlled chaos. 
Jackson Pollock laid his canvases on the ground and dripped and splattered paint onto them using stir sticks, presenting the viewer with a manifestation of the creative act itself. Helen Frankenthaler poured paint directly onto her canvases and let it flow and soak in, sometimes directing it by tilting the frame, other times letting the paint go where it wanted. A mix of planning and spontaneity. Mark Rothko's canvases are perfect expressions of liminal space. He applied layer after layer of paint thinned with turpentine, creating fields of color that bleed in and out of each other without any clear boundaries and seem to pulse with an internal force when you look at them in person, as if they're radiating some cosmic Finally, the work of Gerhard Richter manifests the shift from bodily representation to indefinable abstraction. A German artist who can paint such convincing images one might mistake them for photographs, he subverted these images by blurring them. This blurred, smeared aesthetic eventually led him to the style for which he's best known, his squeegee paintings. These are paintings which he created by using a squeegee to scrape and smear colors across the canvas, adding new paint with one motion and subtracting paint with another. He chose the colors, where to place them, but the squeegee adds a random element. It's a process of concealing and revealing that is both controlled and unpredictable. Looking at his 1987 work, Abstractus Built, number 635, we can see the result is a riot of joyful color, exploding in all directions at once. The colors interact with each other, bold and independent here, mixing and melting into each other elsewhere without clear beginning or end. Like the Mblo masks, this painting is not about the resurrection, but it conveys the essence of the resurrection. A new creation, a new way of creating, a universal language, a liminal space between realities, beautiful and confounding, simultaneously ordered and irrational, firmly grounded in the elements of our world, but a fundamentally different way of encountering them. Don't hold on to me. Don't cling to physical representation. Just as the mature works of artists like Mondrian and Rothko and Richter all were rooted in traditional representational painting, but revealed a fundamentally new way of creating and communicating and experiencing the intangible aspects of our world, the resurrection was rooted in a physical bodily change that led to a fundamental shift in our existence and relationship with God. That's it for today. Wait. Found him on the Wikipedia. Nicholas Hagenauer was a German late Gothic sculptor from Hagenau. That's it? Seriously? I'll fix that. Most famous for being the other guy of the Eisenheim altarpiece. Justice. As we celebrate the resurrection this Easter, I hope that these works can help us feel the totality of Christ's conquering death, from the physical bodily restoration to the supernatural, inexpressible, and intangible. He is risen.